Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. And welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, a licensed clinical professional counselor here in Annapolis, Maryland, providing online therapy to the residents of Maryland. I'm excited to be talking to Eileen Flanagan in a bit about activism and how we can make a difference, our individual acts of activism. And I'm excited about that conversation. And it's the perfect time to release this episode because last week on Wednesday was Earth Day, but also the 50-year anniversary of the very first Earth Day back in 1970. I can remember My mom took us out of school. We got to go to the Earth Day celebration in Philadelphia. I remember it as a very exciting time as a maybe 10 or 11-year-old being able to get taken out of school, go to this big field where there was music playing and lots of people, and it felt very exciting. I felt very cool compared to my classmates who had to stay behind talking about it years later with my mom. She (laughs) had a very different perspective on it. She thought it was a pain in the ass. Too many people, lots of people smoking pot, and here she had her kids there. So kind of ironic to think about that. But perfect time to air this episode in honor of Earth Day. If you would like to get on the newsletter for the podcast and my blog, just go to progressioncounseling.com and there is a form to fill out at the bottom of the page. You can also subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts or um, Google on your Android devices, Stitcher, Spotify, you can subscribe to the podcast there. And if you feel so inclined, leave an honest review. That would be great. You can also follow us on social media at Woman Warriors on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So today, my guest is Eileen Flanagan. She's a graduate of Duke and Yale and is the award-winning author of three books and scores of articles. In addition to helping people to make their activism more effective through her online courses, she speaks to international audiences on how to build a spiritually grounded and effective climate justice movement. For five years, she served as board chair of Earth Quaker Action Team, a scrappy little group which successfully pressured one of the largest banks in the U.S. to stop financing mountaintop coal removal. Her current work focuses on the intersection of racial and environmental justice. I know I worry about climate change. I worry about racial injustice. I worry about Does my little bit of activism actually make a difference? And I'm hoping Eileen will be able to talk to us about all of that. She truly is a woman warrior, helping other people, other women, find their role in activism. So let's get started. Hi, Eileen, and welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. 
I really appreciate your taking the time to be with on the po- be with us on the podcast. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to just share with the listeners a little bit about you and what has inspired you to th- do the work that you do. Thank you. Well, I've been an author for over 25 years and I've taught in different capacities during that time. But it was really about eight years ago that I started feeling a lot of anxiety about climate change. The more I learned, the more scary it seemed. But my individual efforts to make a difference felt inadequate. Carrying my reusable water bottle, which I'm constantly forgetting and leaving places, you know, <laughs> didn't feel like it was really going to address this global big problem. Um, But I stumbled into a group that really combined strategic activism with a sense of spiritual grounding, which was important to me. Spirituality was what I was writing and teaching about. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. It gave me a sense that I could make a difference. I could impact big issues by working with other people and doing it in smart, strategic ways. Mm -hmm. So I've been the board chair of a group called Earthquaker Action Team, which had a successful campaign against a $4 billion a year bank with no staff, no office, (laughs) mostly volunteers and mostly women um, in the early years, just organizing together. Um, So after that experience, I started teaching online the skills that I had learned through that process. Mm -hmm. And that's a major part of what I do now is speaking and teaching online. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think I said this maybe in one of our emails, but like to me, climate change is feels so important, but it's also such a huge issue that, I, I, you know, I often worry that like, like, do my individual efforts make enough? What can I be doing to make more of an impact? Um as you said, yeah, I carry a reusable water bottle. I bought, you know, reusable bags for my produce at the grocery store so I don't have to use plastic. But like climate change is huge. Right, right. And important. There's two main things I would say about that. First of all, you're not alone. I think a lot of people have this angst. And I think the message that we've gotten that it's all on us to change our light bulbs is actually been unhelpful because it adds to the sense of despair that people have. Um, The two things I'd say are one, something Bill McKibben, the uh, climate activist and writer says a lot, which is stop thinking about what you can do as an individual and ask what can we do? And I think that framing is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So whether you join a group like mine, or maybe you work at a school and you can get your cafeteria to be more sustainable in its practices. Uh, We're seeing now how important hospitals are. There's tons of waste in hospitals. Our faith communities, our um, wider groups that we're part of, like if we can even just move one level up and think instead of what am I doing, but what we can do, mm. that makes a huge shift. Yeah. We also need to shift things on the national and international level. And that is where it is overwhelming. One of the concepts I teach in my classes is called the four roles of social change. hmm And it came from work by a sociologist who studied successful change movements and realized that these four roles showed up over and over again. And in brief, they're the helper, the advocate, the organizer, and the rebel. Hmm. And what's helpful about it, I find, is that it's a frame that says you don't have to do everything, but figure out which of these ones you are (laughs) and do that as well as you can. Yeah. So would you like a brief story to illustrate? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So a lot of us know the Rosa Parks story, or at least we know part of it. We know Rosa Parks refused to move um, from on a segregated bus mm-hmm. and was arrested for that. Well, so that would be the rebel role. The rebel challenges the status quo in a way that kind of shakes things up. Mm-hmm. Um, but Rosa Parks didn't act alone. The women of Montgomery, Alabama had been talking about the buses for a long time. The buses were a place that uh, African-American women 
experienced a lot of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And so they had been talking about what can we do about the buses? So there was a woman named Joanne Robinson who led this group of women. And as soon as she heard that Rosa Parks was arrested, Joanne Robinson started organizing. She was mm -hmm. a teacher, so she had access to a mimeograph machine. Wow. If anyone, I mean, your listeners remember <laughs> mimeograph machines. I do, yes. <laughs> um, she stayed up all night making thousands of flyers saying, let's boycott the buses on one day. Wow. Now, she also was connected to the wider movement, um, the NAACP. So Joanne Robinson was playing the organizer role. She's right. on getting people together, saying, what can we do together? Mm. The advocate role was played by the NAACP, in particular, a man named E.D. Nixon. The advocates use the system to make change. So uh, Rosa was breaking the rules. Um, the NAACP filed a lawsuit. Mm. So whether it's petitions or phone calls to your legislature or, you know, the tools of the system are what advocates use to make change. So the NAACP filed a lawsuit in support of the bus boycott, but the boycott ended up lasting over a year. And they never would have been able to sustain that if it hadn't been for the helpers. Mm. The helpers were the people who cooked for the big church gatherings. They were the people who drove people who couldn't walk for over a year. You know, imagine walking to work, walking to church, walking to school. There were people who volunteered to just drive people. Wow. And I think that in any issue, including in the moment that we're in, we're recording this during the COVID-19 crisis, yes. we're seeing people show up in those different roles, right? Some people are bringing people food. Other people are trying to get bills through Congress. Other people are trying to organize great Zoom meetings so we can all figure out what we need. <laughs> yeah, right. And rebels are still trying to figure out, like, how do we do our thing in this environment? But there are groups doing it. Um, there was a honking protest in Philadelphia the other day where everybody, like, circled around City Hall in their um, cars around protecting people in prisons and, like, honked for an hour. <laughs> wow. Um, so I've just found that framework really, really helpful because I think women in particular are socialized to think we need to do everything oh, and we yeah. kind of run from thing to thing. And just the idea I can pick one, I can stay in my lane and do that as well as possible is part of what's made me feel much more empowered than I did several years ago. Yeah, I, I think, yes, either the, the, the sense that I have to be able to do it all and do it all perfectly. Yes. Or like what happens for me sometimes is that like, well, that, yeah, that idea that like I have to do it all, then I'm like, well, I just can't do any of it. You know, that just feels too much. So I like this sort of, you know, find the role that fits you personally, you know, that feels most comfortable to you because then that would make it much easier to do the work. Yeah, and I think that applies as well to the individual changes we were mentioning at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I still carry my reusable bottle. There are things that I try to do to be more environmentally sustainable myself. But what I've realized is I think of them now more as almost like a spiritual practice than as a change strategy. And mm -hmm. I just pick a few. I remember years ago seeing this book that was like a thousand and one things to do to save the earth. And it was like, it's too much. I can't yeah. do a thousand and one things. Like, <laughs> right. like, like if I can do thing. one thing. Right. Yeah. right. So yeah. there's a few things that I try to do faithfully, but I believe it's unproductive for us to obsess too much about our individual lives. We need yeah. to change the big systems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't know, I get a little frustrated, um, I guess, just with the current administration's lack of acknowledgement about how important climate change is. And it seems like not just here in the U.S., but there's other countries, too, that are sort of minimizing our impact on the earth. Um, and that's 
that feels so hard to me. I don't understand that. Like, and it ends up making me feel like what's wrong with them? Like they're the problem versus me, you know, um, which isn't necessarily helpful either. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you say that. I have been doing a Facebook Live series during the COVID-19 crisis with other change makers. And yesterday I interviewed an indigenous author named Sherry Mitchell, who would be a great guest for your show, by the way. Oh, awesome. um, a very powerful indigenous woman. And she was talking a lot about the change that we can make. And then someone through the comments asked about like, what about those people, those people who are the problem? Right. And um, part of what emerged in the conversation, which I really appreciated, and the, the way I would frame it is when you're talking to individuals, it's very unhelpful to come in with the like, this is what you're doing wrong yeah. kind of approach, which is some of what turned me off to environmentalism early on, I have to say, you know, like the finger wagging, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you forgot your canvas bag in the supermarket or whatever the thing is. Yeah. Um, so I would say on one-on-one, -on -one, definitely emphasizing more my own humility, compassion for people not being judgmental. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get to the societal level, you are absolutely right that there are plenty of leaders, many of whom take tons of money from the fossil fuel industry, Mm -hmm. who are not just not doing the right thing. They are standing in the way of the right thing. They are rolling back environmental protections, pulling out of the Paris climate yeah. agreement. It's just unconscionable. And so we do need a different approach to address people in power. And that's part of why I love nonviolent direct action. I think there's a way to do it that can be grounded in love. It can be grounded in integrity and it can still say, uh, no, mm -hmm. we're not going along with that. And part of what um, Sherry Mitchell said yesterday, she used the analogy of the stern mother. She said, mm -hmm. if your child is hitting someone with a stick you take away the stick, you isolate them, you put them in a corner, you make it so they can't do that anymore. But that doesn't mean you're no longer grounded in love. Mm -hmm. You're still operating out of love, but it is the responsible thing to do to stop someone who's doing harm. And mm -hmm. I just love that as an analogy for my work in um, nonviolent direct action, which is um, the course I have coming up is about that. It's about how can we basically stop the harm that's happening by working together in ways that are creative and courageous and strategic, uh, but grounded in a sense of caring, not, not blaming in the way that I think you were referring to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it the blaming the us versus them, I feel like just ends up dividing us even more. Um, and it makes it hard to feel compassionate towards other people. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of um, the stern mother <laughs> being a mom myself. Like I have played that role before. So right. yeah, it comes <laughs> from love, but yeah, you're not going to poke your brother in the eye with a stick. That's not going to work. Well, and you mentioned the polarization. Um, I, I understand exactly what you mean. It's uncomfortable, you know, in your family or in your community when people are so polarized. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I learned from a mentor of mine, George Lakey, who's been uh, leading activism for over 60 years, and he's written 10 books on how to make change. He pointed out that we actually make the greatest progress in times of polarization. Hmm. And um, when we look at the 1930s or the 1960s or um, periods when there were kind of moments of breakthrough, it was often when uh, people had a lot of anxiety about, you know, on both ends, right? You know, people yeah. on different ends of the spectrum um, really being at odds. Um, hmm. He pointed out that those eras of greatest progress were the same eras when the Klan was on the rise in the United States, mm. which um, was a surprising idea to me, but it's really true. 
So um, on the one hand, again, this is where I think the interpersonal is different from the societal. Mm -hmm. I work to maintain good relations (laughs) with family members who might see very differently from me. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I think we can't be afraid to say we have really different ideas about how our country and how the world should run. And it's okay in that spirit of uh, protection, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, To be kind of fierce about them. And that was a huge change for me as a woman. I went to 10 years of all girl Catholic school. I was not socialized to be fierce, Mm. but I've come to see the, value in it and necessity of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is a, a, a not for all women, you know, there are some women who are raised to be fierce, but I definitely was not. And conflict was not something that I learned how to manage well, you know, I, it was more like step away and make nice, make peace versus mm-hmm. really s- standing true in my beliefs. Um, and that's hard for me sometimes. And I think that you're, you're right. It's not the same with all women and there are differences by class and culture and race, you know, in the specifics of how women are socialized. Mm-hmm. But I think that definitely I'll say among white women, I think many of us were trained that, it, and especially white middle-class, highly educated women, like being nice, yeah, um, work hard and be nice. And as you said, try and do everything perfectly yeah. uh, are very common lessons that many of us got. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if there were you know, tips or um, resources for women who wanted to be more proactive, be more active, find ways to speak up against climate change, against whatever their passionate, uh, their passion and, and their uh, social injustice, whatever they feel like they wanted to speak up against. How Are there tips that, you know, or resources that would be helpful for them to kind of help them find their way? Sure. Um, I'll sit, share a few. First, starting with what I offer. Um, I do have an approximately monthly newsletter where I write about my own experience and lessons and people can join that at EileenFlanagan.com. Awesome. Um, So that would be great. Um, I also teach online classes, which are not going to be for everyone because not everyone is going to be feel drawn to the rebel role. Mm -hmm. Um, My upcoming class is about that. It's about building a nonviolent direct action campaign but that is not just for climate activists. It could be on any issue that you're concerned about. If you're thinking about how to be um, more effective in challenging decision makers who are just on the wrong side of things Um, on my website, you can find information about that class, which starts May 7th in this round. Cool. Cool. In terms of the broader um, issue of women finding their voice, someone who's been a real resource for me is Tara Moore, T-A-R-A-M-O-H-R. She wrote a book called Playing Big. She offers online courses on playing big and, um, you know, also has a newsletter and things like that. And some of the issues she talks about um, really have helped me grow in my activism. So one in particular, she has a chapter in the book called Unhooking from Praise and Criticism. Hmm. And um, realizing that, yeah, if you do anything bold in this world, you're going to get criticized. And Again, many of us were socialized to be worried about what other people think about us. I'm oh yeah, part of a writer's Facebook group where this just came up yesterday. Um, an author got some pretty nasty criticism on one of her books. And so she decided to stop being an author. Wow. And right, that's so frustrating. Mm. And um, with all compassion for that woman, Mm -hmm. 
like a lot of the Facebook thread was sort of about like, yeah, these bad people, they don't realize they have, you know, the ability to silence people. And I'm like, wait a minute, we need to stop cooperating with that. Right. right. Yes. Right. They need to stop being nasty on social media. But in the meantime, how do we support each other so that we don't crumble when we get our first bad review on Amazon? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well right? that, yeah. And I would say that holds true for, yeah, podcasters too. I mean, we've, I've had, I'm part of groups for other podcasters and therapists too, where you get a bad review and you're like, how do I, do I respond? Do I ignore it? Do I delete it? Like, how do I sit with that? And, you know, a lot of what we try to encourage each other is that you're, you've obviously poked somebody. So what you had to say was important. (laughs) Right. Right. I think that's true. Two of the things Tara Moore says about that first is she says all criticism tells you more about the critic than it does about you. Yes. Yes. And that doesn't mean we can't learn from criticism, Sure. but we have to disentangle our sense of value from what other people think Mm -hmm. about our work. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So that concept I think can be really helpful The other just little thing that I remember she recommends is go on Amazon, look for your favorite authors and read all the terrible reviews they got. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of funny, like someone who you hold up as like this great author, there's somebody who gave them a one star scathing review. And it's just helpful to realize like that comes with the territory of being in the public eye. And Brene Brown also talks a lot about this. Yes, Um, yes. The idea of being in the arena. Brene Brown says that she doesn't um, take any criticism from someone who's not themselves taking risks and being vulnerable. Like Mm -hmm. if you're just sitting on the couch writing nasty stuff on Facebook, like, yeah, it's not even going to read it. (laughs) Right, right, right. Not going to add that to how, how valuable my work is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's so, it's so easy to be faceless and criticize in the world today. I mean, just as you said, sitting on the couch and writing a nasty review versus approaching someone and saying, hey, you know, I was offended by or whatever, you know, offering face to face a criticism of something we've either said or done or Yeah. And it's, again, I keep coming back to this thing about the interpersonal versus the societal, you know, if I have a relationship with someone and they're offended by something that I say, I have a completely different reaction Mm -hmm. than a Facebook troll. I have um, a friend who's African-American who has a blog called my American melting pot. She's married to a Spanish man. And a lot of it is about intercultural issues And she asked me to write a piece about the role of race in climate change and environmental issues, Mm. which is part of the new book that I'm working on now. It's called The Illusion of Separation. Yes. So I wrote this piece for Lori, um, uh, Lori Tharps, and she got more shares than she usually gets. Um, So it was kind of exciting. Like, you know, we both were getting a lot of traction out of this. I got more trolls than I think I've ever gotten. Oh. And, but I just had to realize like, oh yeah, climate change brings out the trolls and racism brings out the trolls. Yeah. So I just wrote a piece about those two things. And it's important for me to remember that this is part of a deliberate strategy of people mm-hmm. who are denying both of those issues to harass people in Facebook. Yeah. And yeah. so why would I spend ener- any energy getting hooked by these people, even though it's really hard not to? Yeah. yeah. So that to me is like a completely different category than, you know, the in-law who doesn't understand what I do. Right. Absolutely. No, I agree. I agree. Well, I love, uh, you know, I have, I have signed up for your newsletter and, um, and just talking to you here that you're so willing to share your own experience with everything that you're doing. You know, I feel like that's so important because we can kind of idealize people as like, oh, they, they've got it all figured out and 
how to do whatever it is, but to own and be vulnerable about how, like you've got more trolls than any other post. Like that's really hard. And two, it says something about what you put out there, but I appreciate your sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, how do people find you if they want to find you and find know more about what you're doing and offering? The easiest way for people to follow me is to go to my website, EileenFlanagan.com, E-I-L-E-E-N-F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. And there you can find my newsletter sign up. You can find my online classes. If you're interested in inviting me to speak to your community, um, there's information about all those things. I also have a Facebook author page, which is Eileen Flanagan author. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I think I'm just Eileen Flanagan on Twitter. Um, I'm newly on Instagram. (laughs) Oh, awesome. (laughs) Um, So I would love if your followers um, join me in those places. Very cool. Well, um, I will include all of your links in the show notes and uh, as well as the resources that you mentioned. Uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to be on the podcast today, Eileen, and uh, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. One of the things I've realized in the last few years is whether it's the climate crisis or any of our other major problems, we're not going to solve them without empowering women. So I'm really excited about the work that you're doing and that your listeners are doing. We need each other. We need each other to make change. Mm, So, so true. Thank you. I really enjoyed that conversation with Eileen. She is, uh, she has a lot to offer in terms of nonviolent communication but activism. I do appreciate her willingness to share her process and progress in her own journey in being an activist. And climate change, it is something that I, as I said in the intro, I do worry about it. And not only is it impacting our world, but it's, it's something that can create change on so many other levels of, you know, taking care of our health and our environment and the species that are living on the planet today. And it just feels so, so important, keeping our water clean, keeping our fish healthy and safe, all that. So I hope that you will check out her resources and her upcoming course. You can find all the links to her offerings in the show notes. I hope you will all have a terrific week. I hope that you explore whether what role you would like to take in being either an activist or a rebel or I'm forgetting the other two, but organizer. Um, yeah. Have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to the Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com. Thank you.